Good evening. Welcome to CB8 Speaks. Uh, my name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a member of Community Board 8 in Manhattan and your host for this evening's interview. Our uh, guest tonight is Nick Viest, who is newly re-elected as chair of Community Board 8. And uh, Nick, welcome back to uh, CB8 Speaks. Great. It's good to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Nick Viest was first appointed to CB8 in 1997 and over the years has served as or chaired or co-chaired several committees including street life, public safety, and the street vendor task force. Nick's a seasoned sales executive, one of the nation's largest paper merchants, who still manages to give a great deal of time to public service. Uh, this month he begins his second one-year term as our board's chairman. And Nick, I know you're also president of the 19th Precinct Community Council and you serve on the board of the Holy Trinity Neighborhood Center. Uh, which is an important resource serving the homeless and the needy in Yorkville. And you've remained an active member of the New York County Republican Party. Where did this <laughs> commitment to public service come from? How, how did you? It started w really with my mother who was involved. Uh, she, she moved to the east side back in 19, I want to say 1979. Um, and she was actually an auxiliary policewoman. Mm -hmm. Um, and she served in that for a number of years. And so I started to get involved with her uh, actually uh, on the 19th Precinct Community Council. And then there were some local issues that uh, she was involved in with East 79th Street Neighborhood Association. She was a member of that. So that's sort of how I got involved in this whole thing um, through my mom, who actually is still a member of the 19th Precinct Community Council and serves on the board at 86 years old. So anyway, yeah, it comes, comes from the family, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you're uh, active in the local Republican Party. Uh, you were appointed to the community board by a Democrat back in 97, uh, reappointed several times by Democrats. What does that say about how candidates are selected? I was appointed uh, actually by a Republican at that time in 97, but reappointed by Democrats. Um, and it, it doesn't, in, in one sense, is really um, there's really not an issue there in terms of whether you're a Democrat or a Republican as far as the community board is concerned because the issues uh, uh, in, that we're involved in are not really political issues. Um, they're issues about the community and about e quality of life issues or land use, transportation. As Fiorello LaGuardia used to say, you know, there's no, there's no Democrat or Republican way to pick up the garbage. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what what the spirit of the community board is. You, uh, in, in, you could go through a whole year in our meetings and not really know if someone is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, in fact, I, I found that to be true. There are some people I know who are Republicans I had no idea they were. Um, but it, it's doesn't, it doesn't really come into play. And I think you know, the, the point that of your question is a good one, wh which is that, that the, the community board is valuable because it's not political, because mm. it's, not, it's not based on what an affiliation or belief that you have. It's really focused on trying to make a better community for all of us who, who live there on top of each other. The role of, of community boards in the political process is not uh, well understood by the public. By political, I mean in the city government uh, uh, machinery. Uh, some people think we have great power. And uh, we just don't care or don't listen. We hear that very often from people who are coming before the board to uh, ask that something be built or not be built or be someplace else. Uh, others think the whole community board process is a waste of time. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think it was worth your time. Um, as the public face of the community board, how do you explain the value of these bodies? We do get that question all the time. And the first of all, the, the main function of, as, as I see it, the main function of the community board is to give the public the, a, a, a voice in the community. It gives them the ability to come to a meeting and address an issue that's important to them. It could be about a noisy bar, it could be about a building that's going up in their neighborhood, it could be about garbage, it could be about any issue that, that affects their life. And the, the, the real value of the community board is that, that it's a place for them to come to. And it's in the evening that we hold our meetings. So it's normally convenient, at least someone who's not working at night, it's convenient for somebody to be able to get there and uh, make a statement, uh, express what, what their concerns are. In terms of the, the power authority that the community board has, 
uh, it's true that we, we are advisory. So in, in one sense, if we, if we pass a resolution that says, says we recommend uh, that an establishment should get a liquor license or it shouldn't get a liquor license, the state liquor authority doesn't have to listen to us. They're not bound by what we say. But we, we really have two functions. Number one, we do provide input to these city and state agencies, which they, they'll listen to. They won't, they won't always do what we ask them to do, but they'll always listen to it. And, they, and I think they take it under advisement. And in many cases, they'll, they'll use what we recommend and, and act on it. The other thing it does is it allows the public elected officials uh, to use our uh, recommendations as well. Um, as, a, as a way to craft their own views on what is important uh, as far as the community is concerned. So, so it actually has a real function. It has, it has a type of power which, which is not binding, but actually does exist. Uh, it is effective, I'll put it that way. It's effective in being a voice for the, for the community. Uh, and I think there it really has a, has a real value. It's really the lowest level of uh, community of, 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 of civic government in New York. Um, but it, it, I, in my own firm belief is that it has a very valuable function uh, in allowing people to come out and try to get a problem solved that they otherwise might not be able to get dealt with uh, through the normal channels of city government. And the board office itself is a resource. Right. And, and so there's a, and, and just for people who don't know, there's also a community board office that's open from 9 to 5. Uh, if you have a problem, you can call that number at 212-758-4359. Uh, the, th that office, you're, you're able to send in whatever question or issue you have uh, about uh, in your community, that, that something that might be concerning you or a problem you may have, and you'll get a response. And, and in some cases, uh, the community board may be able to help you. In other cases, we refer it to another city or state agency. Depends what your problem is. But that, that board office has full-time employees uh, whose job it is uh, to handle things like that among the other many things that they do there. So yeah, there is, there is a, an office and that, that's, that's very helpful. It's helpful for me also as a chairman uh, to have a, a functioning office uh, that, that can basically handle all the day-to-day -day stuff that, that comes in front of the community board. How did you first get involved with the community board? I knew some people who were members uh, of, of the board um, and uh, they, I was actually speaking to some people about, you know, what, what other community organizations are sort of out there. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know that it existed at the time, uh, and, and I'd lived in New York for some time, but I think most people, unless they come into direct contact with us through an issue, they probably have no idea that a community board even exists. And so uh, they said, th there's this organization, it's a community board, if you're interested in doing more kind of community stuff, that's really an organization that, that you can join. One of them was actually a member of the board, and so I was able to get recommended uh, to, to be on the board. But I, uh, prior to that, I, I didn't know that it existed and, and had this, uh, this whole, this whole um, uh, sort of responsibility for all these various uh, functions uh, that, that we have. It's actually pretty <laughs> interesting. I think this is true probably for most people, though, that they mm. They rarely get it involved with it. Most people, New Yorkers, uh, tend, tend to be workaholics. I think we sort of get up, go to work, grind it out, and then come home. And then unless some problem confronts us, we, uh, it, we, we sort of just uh, we go through our routine. My experience was the same. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know what community boards were. I didn't know they existed. But I went to uh, a public official that I had known from high school and said, I want to get involved. I want to do some service. And a very similar story. Let's talk about your first term as chair, what you see as challenges ahead this year. For example, what were the key issues that uh, Community Board 8 had to deal with last year? Right. A number of issues uh, that, we, that we have and that we have that are, some are ongoing. Um, we, had a, we had a very big land use issue that came before our board, which involved Roosevelt Island. This is the Cornell Technion. Uh, development, uh, major uh, uh, university uh, that uh, is building a facility on Roosevelt Island. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a significant pr uh, project. Millions of dollars are being spent. And uh, the community board was heavily involved in the, what we, what we call the part of the approval process 
uh, for the, this land use item, okay? And so the way it works is that there are variances uh, to the, the, the sort of city rules what, that govern these things. The institution will come in front of the community board and ask uh, for us to weigh in on these variances, to decide mm -hmm. whether these should be approved or not approved. We, we're, we're part of that approval process. And a, as part of that approval process, what we did was we held multiple hearings and meetings so that the residents could also come out and express whatever concerns they have or views they have uh, on this project on their island. And it's, it's, a it's, it's a major project. It's also one that's going to be built uh, it, it basically on, uh, they're going to have to construct it and they're going to have to run trucks through this island. There's only one road that services the island. So there's major impacts involved. There's major transportation issues that are involved. Uh, so, so for the years, coming years that uh, this is going to be constructed, there is going to be an impact on the community. So we had really two roles, I think, in you know, two major roles, we can say, and, and one of them was to assess the actual uh, variances, were, which were somewhat technical uh, for, for, for building this site, but also to be able to convey to the institution and also to the city what the major issues were, the major concerns were that the community had on Roosevelt Island regarding this massive project. So that, that, I think that was very important. Uh, and we passed a resolution with a number of conditions that we feel will, will help to protect the, the, the residents, certainly to voice the concerns that they have. Uh, and, that's, and I think that's really what's important. And we spent a lot of time uh, working on it. All the meetings uh, were held uh, on Roosevelt Island with the exception of the final vote, which was actually a, had been uh, the prior meeting had been de delayed for a vote and the, re the local residents felt they actually recommended that we push this off uh, for one of the meetings so we held that on Manhattan. But all the other meetings were held on Roosevelt Island. The, the vast number of people that were on this task force on our committee that handled it were Roosevelt Island residents. We really felt that it was, it was very important to get their viewpoint and to have them have the input into what is important for them. Uh, and, and I felt very strongly about this. I felt strongly about it living in Manhattan, understanding that I don't live on Roosevelt Island, but it's important that really the point of view that we need to express is the, the point of view from the residents who live there and are going to be dealing with this and living with it for the next n many years that, that they're there. So that, you know, in terms of what, one, that, that was really, I think, one of the major issues. I was pleased with the resolution that we crafted. I thought it was a substantive resolution that, that captured the essence of what people were asking for, and it showed that we took this very seriously. Obviously, the other, the other big issue is the Second Avenue subway. That's, th that's ongoing. Um, there, there are other issues uh, uh, in, in our community. There are quality of life type issues. Uh, we formed a, a, a vendor uh, task force that's meeting now on a regular basis that's trying to deal with what I would call is a proliferation of vendors. These are, uh, some, in some cases, they're sh street vendors. In some cases, they're vendors who are actually trying to sell out of trucks. But we're seeing a lot more of this. And so what we're trying to do as a community board is to come up with a way to figure out how we regulate this better. Because at this point, some of this is not regulated as well as, as we would like, or else the regulations um, can be a bit confusing uh, to, and, and certainly difficult to enforce. Uh, and then there's, 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 there's other issues in terms of illegal vendors and so on, but that's another area that, that you know, we've been spending a lot of time on. So it's really, I think, if you, know, if you had to break it down in terms of the issues that come in front of us, you know, these, these have been quality of life or land use type issues like, like, like Cornell. The other ones that are coming up with, you know, these the types of issues are major institutions such as the hospitals expanding. New York Hospital uh, is, is building a new facility. Memorial Sloan Kettering is building a new facility. Hospital for Special Surgery is building a new facility. Uh, CUNY uh, is building a new facility. All of these are being built. They're pushing up north from where they are now, which is in the high 60s, basically, on York Avenue and moving into what are sort of more residential neighborhoods. So these are big trends that uh, we certainly uh, take interest in. 
Uh, the other, the other big issue was the trash uh, transfer station on uh, 91st Street and York Avenue. That's been ongoing. The, the the board's position is that we are opposed to it, the transfer station, because of its location. We think that it's inappropriate. It's actually a uh, basically a playground. It's called Asphalt Green. It's where kids play soccer every day, uh, and also it's on the entrance to it is right on York Avenue, right in a residential area. In an, and also in an area which is quite congested and where there are traffic issues uh, where cars come in, coming on and off the drive and so on. So there's a bunch of stuff happening uh, that have been, has been going on and that will be going on in, in, in Community Board 8. And it's all never, of those it's are, never boring. Those are, those are all <laughs> going to continue. The subway continues to uh, uh, bring new problems and, and, and new promises down the road. Right. Sure. And that's a major right. I mean, and David, that's a major, that's a major issue for the residents. And I think, I think it's a very difficult um, problem, uh, challenge. Uh, it, there is obviously the opportunity, uh, once it gets built, it'll be a fine transportation system and it will relieve uh, the congestion on the Lexington Avenue line, which is needed because uh, I ride the Lexington Avenue line and I know firsthand how crowded that, that train can be uh, mm -hmm. at rush hour, even in non-rush hour times, I find it. But the problem is that the price that the residents and the businesses are having to pay on Second Avenue is a steep one. It's a very tough problem for them. Um, and so, you, the, you know, we can talk about mitigation and so on, but I don't think that's really a fair term to use for the Second Avenue, so because I don't think there's a way to mitigate the impacts of something that significant. If we think about the Second Avenue subway, it is the largest project, I think, that we've experienced in our neighborhood, uh, period. Are there anything emerging issues that um, look to be becoming um, uh, larger on the horizon in, in this coming year? The expansion of the institutions is one which is a significant factor. That's going to affect York Avenue in the 70s. Uh, that when, you, when you're building 20-story buildings um, in an area and you're going to be taking in eight, ten thousand 10,000 people a day into some of these facilities, that, that has a significant impact on the neighborhood in terms of parking issues, in terms of transportation issues, in terms of the construction vehicles that will be there to build it, in terms of the construction impacts that it has on that area. So that's, that's a if you want to talk about something that's on the horizon, that's there and that's going forward. We're going to have to deal with that. And so, you know, that's something certainly that's important. We talk about the Second Avenue subway. I think that you know, obviously there's going to be changes when it, the, the, the projected finish date, I think, is 2017. Um, so when that gets built, uh, certainly that's going to bring more people, I think, in t into the area. We have to see how that will develop. It's, I think at this point it's probably difficult to say exactly how things will change on second, but we do know that with transportation, uh, the, the, the blocks around those areas, uh, you know, close, closer to the train, people are going to want to live there because that's, that's great commuting, right? So we go we're going to see some type of impact there. What types of businesses come out of that and how exactly that plays out. I'm not sure we know that yet because it de a lot will depend on the climate, the real estate climate and the business climate in New York at that time. But certainly something we have to keep our eye on uh, and, and monitor and, 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 and maybe have some discussions about sort of how we think see things playing out. But I think at this point for the 2nd Avenue subway, we still have to come up with ways to talk to the public and about it uh, and, and make sure that we're trying to do everything we can to help them deal with the situation that exists right now. The select uh, bus service, the sort of super limited buses on 1st and 2nd Avenue, right. uh, um, they're pretty successful. There, there was a problem with the, the blue lights that uh, turns out that state law requires they only be on emergency vehicles. And I, mean, I understand from one of our board members that they've turned the lights off, but they haven't replaced them yet with another Right. blinking light that just makes them visible. I'll have to refer that to the Transportation Committee to see what recommendation they might have on something like that. I, I agree it is a little bit of an issue because, and I take that bus so I can comment on it, um, it you do want to be able to see it um, because of the way that system is set up, 
you purchase a, a, a receipt, basically, to get on that bus, and you do it ahead of time. So you want to be able to see you know, when it's coming so you can get your receipt and get on. You don't pay when you get on the bus like a normal right. city bus. It's an express, essentially what it is, is it's an express bus. Uh, but it runs at a, ver a, a much, uh, it, it, st it stops at fewer stops, but you also can enter at three different points on the bus, as opposed to a regular city bus where you get on, pay your fare, and walk to the back. So this all is done to ex expedite the service, make it easier to kind of get on and off the bus. I think it works quite well. I did have some comments from some seniors who said they had some difficulty getting off the bus in some cases. For some reason, it seems like some of the, st the, the step getting off, on the, especially on the back uh, exits, may be a little bit high in cases. I, I, I was trying to find out more information on that. We're going to follow up and, mm. and find out if that's an issue with some more people. But I did ask transportation committee to look, to look into that. I guess those select buses, uh, they've been successful for the most part. Uh, I also noticed that the city is enforcing the fares on that, and they will send out inspectors to go and check your, your tickets and so on. I don't know how long-term, I haven't heard long-term what the city plans to do when they finally put the subway in and whether they'll retain that service or not. Um, but it is, I do find that it's quite a good service. I think they're trying to institute it on some of the crosstown streets as well. So I think probably it's a fair bet that it's here to stay. Um, so far, I've heard fairly good sort of reviews with a few comments that some people feel it's uh, not perfect, which that's, this is, uh, <laughs> this is New York. Many people don't realize those paper receipts can be used on a local bus if a local comes first. Initially, the, the MTA didn't uh, provide for that, but our local elected officials very quickly helped them to change their positions. However, you can't take it to the subway. Right. If you buy that, you're committed to the bus. In terms of how you work with the bigger picture of all of Manhattan, of the other community boards, of the elected officials, of uh, city government, uh, you meet regularly. There's a, there's a process, there's a procedure for our board's work being passed up to the next level. It's called what? Or a board meeting. And that is, that is a meeting that's held once a month by the Manhattan Borough President's office. Each uh, community board chair attends that meeting or sends someone to represent the board. There are also elected official representatives, and sometimes the city council people will actually be there. So there's representatives from the city council who are at that borough board. And there, uh, there are normal, the normal uh, processes that larger issues of the Manhattan borough are discussed. And oftentimes there's a resolution uh, regarding a certain issue, uh, or there's sometimes there's a presentation about a specific issue. Last month they made a very interesting presentation uh, on the city unit that handles uh, canine uh, and, and, and basically animal control. It's separate from the ASPCA, but people don't know about it, and it's underfunded. In fact, they're having a very difficult time funding it. And so there was a, a whole discussion about how, how it should be changed so that it can get more funding and so that it can operate to, to help the animals who have no one to speak for them. So it, it actually, it, it, m many of these discussions are actually quite good. A few months ago we had a discussion about NYCHA, which is the city housing authority. Uh, again, it was a very uh, informative discussion uh, where they brought in someone who'd actually done a study on that. And then, then we'll also, there's also a number of issues that may come up, borough-wide issues, um, where the borough president may discuss a, an issue about, you know, there was a discussion about busing uh, for s special needs kids, uh, something, an issue that might affect all of the different community boards uh, so on the, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And so, and so uh, it's, quite, it's quite a constructive uh, meeting, uh, and it's a normally an hour uh, that's held uh, on a Thursday morning, first thing in the morning. So yeah, there's a good process there, and I think it's been well run, and I think it's important that you have uh, a means of, of also bouncing off issues that you know, different boards are having, uh, you know, problems that they may be having or whatever that can be discussed uh, in a forum like that. I have to ask you, uh, <coughs> do you enjoy serving as, as chair? You, <laughs> you, you, you seem to be unflappable. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Uh, most I think that's true most of the time. There's a lot of stress, right? but you seem to just, you know, go with the flow, and, and uh, it lowers the tensions in the room. 
Right. Uh, what's your management style? How do, how do you <laughs> well, I think the only time I, uh, I get a little concerned is when we're, we're running out of time in yeah. our meeting and we're told that by the building, and this is a problem for the board, is that uh, in many places we have to be out by 930 and, uh, and I have an hour's worth of material to cover in 15 minutes. So there I might get a, a little bit concerned and I'll probably look a bit worried. But, but for the most part, I think if I stay relatively calm, then, then that, that, that sort of is conveyed to the, to the members. And I think it's also important for me to be as objective as I can and to let someone speak to an issue and let them have their say uh, and be impassioned. But for me, not necessarily to respond in kind or, or uh, because I think then that, that generally you get a back and forth and that's how I think people will um, tend to, to, you know, tempers flare and so on. Uh, and, but I think if the chair stays fairly level-headed on this and, and doesn't try to respond to every uh, issue that's thrown at them, in the, either in the form of a criticism or whatever, um, you, you think you're, you're probably more productive. My, my, my general style is also to let people speak as much as they can, to air their views, but to be respectful in terms of what they, what they have to say, uh, but, but to let them talk, and not for me to comment so much, but to let the board act out and work out its issues um, by the debate mechanism that we have, which is Robert's Rules of Order. And so if I can keep the meeting running fairly well, and if people know there's a format that works, uh, so for instance, when people, a simple thing is when people raise their hands, I try to make sure that there's an order, so I'll call out several names at once so everyone knows these people are going to be speaking and that there's an order there and they don't worry that they're not going to get called on because that creates some angst also. I see people who want to, sometimes they want to speak and they get their hand up and they're, they're you know, motioning me to you know, let me know they want to talk and, and I tr try to get to everyone. But I think if I get, name them all in order sort of and let them know, yes, you're going to get, you're going to get a chance to speak, that keeps a little bit of a calmer atmosphere. You can't always guarantee it, though, and I don't want to jinx it, but I think for the most part, this year we've, we've done a pretty good job of, of staying uh, reasonably calm. Well, I think we've done a pretty good job <laughs> of covering uh, uh, our board's work tonight. Uh, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you so much Great. for taking time out of your day. And, um, Thanks for having me, David. It. Appreciate it. Okay, very good. I had other, other things that I could have spoken to. Uh, this I was given back in 2007. It gives details on how the uh, ULARP works. On It has questions and answers from council on uh, the we, community could boards. Could we get like, copies run off on that? That was given out to new board members at the borough president's training. It's on his website. This Great. So you know what? Um, we're going to, I think, make, make sure people get some extra copies of it.